Hi everyone, it's Pastor Wagner. This is my weekly video blog. Today I want to talk about the sinner's prayer. Now, I'm sure most everybody is familiar with that. It became popularized by Billy Graham and um, Campus Crusade for Christ and some of these other parachurch organizations. And the idea is that you know somebody would go to these meetings, these crusades, and they would hear the gospel and they would be convicted. And then Billy would give them the, this prayer that they're supposed to pray. And when they pray this prayer and they tell Jesus they're a sinner and they ask him to come into their hearts, then that's how they get eternal life. That's the idea. So what I want to do is I want to go through this prayer phrase by phrase, and we're going to look at it and see what the scripture says. And we're actually going to see that if this prayer shows anything, it shows that the person that prays it already has eternal life, if they can actually pray it sincerely. And if they're not praying it sincerely, then it doesn't do anything for them anyway. But far from giving a person eternal life, this prayer would already be would already show that they have eternal life. So let me read the prayer for you first of all. It says, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner, and I ask your I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In your name, amen. So that's the Billy Graham version of the prayer. Like I said, this is supposed to be a means by which somebody gets eternal life, but it actually teaches just, or it shows just the opposite. So let's look at it phrase by phrase. First of all, Lord Jesus. Now, in order for somebody to call Jesus Lord, the Bible says that they already have the Spirit of God. You see, Billy tells you, you got to call it, you say, Lord Jesus, and you repeat the prayer, and then you get the Spirit of God. The Bible says you already have it, or you couldn't call Jesus Lord. In 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 3, it says, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth to Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. You have to have the Holy Ghost to even say, Lord Jesus, to call Jesus your Lord. So if you call him your Lord, it means that you already have the Holy Ghost dwelling in you. You are already regenerated and born again if you can say, Lord Jesus. The next phrase, I know that I am a sinner. Now, see, the thing about sin is it is the transgression of the law. But sinners by nature are not subject to the law of God. Neither can they be. Let me read it to you. First of all, 1 John 3, 4 says, Whoso committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Romans 8, 5 through 7 says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. That's an enemy. For if, or for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So here is a sinner, a carnal man, dead in trespasses and sins, who is not subject to the law of God. So a person like that is not going to say, I know that I'm a sinner. They don't know that they're a sinner, and they don't care that they're a sinner, even if you did tell them that they're a sinner. They have to have a change of the heart first. They have to become spiritually minded to even know that they're a sinner. Okay, the next one. I ask your forgiveness. Now, those who have eternal life and whose sins are already forgiven are the ones who will ask for forgiveness. If you ask for forgiveness, it's because Christ already eternally put away your sins, and it's because you already have eternal life. Let me show it to you. Here's the verse. One of the best verses in the Bible to tell to tells God's children to confess their sins and they'll be forgiven. It's 1 John 1 and verse 9. It says, For if we, can, or if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But this promise is made to God's children. It's not made to some unregenerate reprobate trying to get himself eternal life. John, The people that John is writing to here already are forgiven eternally. 1 John 2 and verse 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are are forgiven you for his sake. See, these people already have forgiveness when they're praying this prayer to ask God to forgive them. They're asking for a temporal, for a fatherly forgiveness, but they're already forgiven under the blood of Christ. They already have eternal life. 1 John 5 verse 13 says, These things have I written unto you, the same people that he wrote and told them to confess their sins in the first chapter, These things have I written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. He's writing to these people saying, I'm telling you that you already have eternal life. He's not telling them how to get it by asking God to forgive their sins. So if you ask God to forgive your sins, it's because you already have eternal life. It's because Christ has already died for your sins eternally. The next phrase, I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. 
Well, this is very problematic because if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, in other words, if you believe he's the Son of God, in other words, if you believe that he died for your sins according to the Scripture, what the Christ would do, what the Son of God would do, then you already are born of God. You don't get to be born of God by believing. You believe because you're born of God. 1 John 5 and verse 1, it says, Whoso believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. He doesn't get to be born of God. He is born. That's a past participle, passive voice construction, which shows that the being born of God comes before the believing in the present. So if this person can truly say, I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead, he's already born of God. He's not getting to be born of God by praying this prayer. One must already be saved to believe the gospel or else it's foolishness to him. 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So if this guy at the Billy Graham rally hears the gospel and he believes it and prays this prayer sincerely, well, guess what? He's already born of God. It's the, the gospel is the power of God to him because he is saved. It says to them which are saved, it's the power of God. If he wasn't already saved, if he was a natural man perishing in his sins, the gospel's foolishness to him. It's not going to make any sense and he wouldn't pray this prayer anyway. The next phrase, I turn from my sins. Now, turning from one's sins is a good thing, right? But the natural man can't do any good things. He can't please God. Look at Romans 3, 10 through 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. So you can't turn from your sins if you're a natural man, if you're a carnal man, if you're at enmity against God. You have to be born again within. You have to have that new spirit within you that God puts in, in you in regeneration. Then you can have the ability and the desire to turn from your sins. The person who turns from his sins is doing righteousness. And we're told that he that doeth righteousness is born of God. 1 John 2 and verse 29. And if you know that he is righteous, you know that every one that doeth righteousness is born of him. So if you pray this prayer and you say, I turn from my sins, you are saying, I'm not doing sin anymore, therefore I'm doing righteousness. Well, guess what? He that doeth righteousness is born of him, is born of God. So you don't get to be born of God by doing righteousness. Doing righteousness is the effect of being born of God. So if you can pray this prayer, you are born of God. And the last phrase, and invite you to come into my heart I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Now, if a person can truly pray this prayer and get to this point and ask the Lord to come into their heart and all this stuff, for the aforementioned reasons, he already is born of God. I've already shown that to you. Let me show you here that the Spirit of God is dwelling in a person such as this. Romans 8, 9 through 11 says, but, if, or, or, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. And I've already shown you the Spirit of God dwells in you. If you say, Lord Jesus, if you truly call Jesus Lord, it's by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is already dwelling in you. And if Christ be in you, uh, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. So the person that can say, Lord Jesus, forgive my sins, come into my life, I believe that you died for my sins, he already has the Spirit of God dwelling in him, else he couldn't make that confession. You remember when, G or when Jesus asked Peter who did he say that he was, and he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God? Jesus said, Flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Peter already had the Spirit of God dwelling in him. That's why he could confess that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. So, the sinner's prayer is nowhere found in the Bible. You're never going to find anything even remotely like this thing in the Bible. The proper response to hearing the gospel with conviction, when a person hears the gospel and they're convicted of their sins, the proper response is to repent and be baptized and be joined into a local church where you worship Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth for the rest of your life. It's not to pray some little four-sentence prayer and then go on your merry way and thinking that you've acquired eternal life. Let me show you to you. Here's the biblical pattern when you hear the gospel and, and are convicted by it. Acts 2.37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They were added unto the church in Jerusalem. 
Verse 42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. They continued having church. Apostles' doctrine and fellowship as the preaching of the word. Breaking of bread is communion, prayers. That's what church is. They continued doing church. And that's the proper response to the gospel. It's not to pray some silly sinner's prayer. It's to get yourself baptized under the yoke of Christ in the church of the living God and worship him in spirit and in truth for the rest of your life. Thanks for your kind and patient attention, and I hope you now understand what the sinner's prayer is and what it is not. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.